Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I, I didn't know that I was being sandbagged. All This is President's Day weekend, and that's why he assigned me this weekend, because he couldn't get anybody else to speak. So, um, but thank you so much, Russ, for having me. Thank all of you for getting up early on this cold morning, and it's good to see you. Good to see all of you. Um, I'll tell you this. I ne you know, I prepare so much. I I'm working on a book. And I probably sp spent 100 hours at least in the last three, four weeks preparing f for this lesson. And, um, you know, my wife thinks that I'm going to be organized as to what I'm going to do. I never know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I never know what I'm going to say. But uh, I just uh, go by that scripture. When, when you need to speak, it will be told you what you should say. And so that's kind of what I do as part of the preparation. Let me just say a couple of things. One is when you, any of you, say something that I am sitting in the pews or in class and don't agree with, it makes my skin want to crawl. And you do that sometimes. But guess what? I love you. I love you. And I... Don't stand up and say, you're a dummy, what are you saying? No, I just bow my head and I say, there's got to be a reason for the way people say things and why they say things. So, having said that, I will step and put my foot in my mouth. And if I do, just remember, treat me the same way that I treat you. <laughs> a week ago, Two weeks ago now, is that the lighting that does this? Two weeks ago now, my wife, oh, she loves fashion and style and furniture and stuff. She invited three Frenchmen from Montreal, Canada for interior design consultation. We got them in my car to take them to lunch. They're sitting in the back seat, three little Frenchmen. They're all whapping in French. And I was just trying to let him know that often Christian and Casey and my little boys sit in the back seat. So I was saying, look, anything could happen back there. You know, you might see anything. I said, even a frog may jump out from under the seat. Now, how many of you know that the English people call the French frogs? <laughs> I mean, of all the things that I could have said, in the whole world, I said, watch out, even a frog might jump out. And you could have dropped a penny, these Frenchmen sitting there like this. And Christy was ready to crawl under the, under the seat because it was so funny. But I didn't get it till later, you know. And I'm like, I remembered a, an English guy I played soccer with who always called the French the frogs. And one day I had to say, who are you talking about? He said, the French. They're all frogs. Anyway, so I can do it. I can do it. But I, I regret it when I do it, and if I do it, forgive me. Now, I'm asked to speak out of the book of Psalms. And I chose a psalm, and I'm going to read it to you. And we're going to talk about it. And use that opportunity of that psalm to make a few points that I believe strongly in. Now, I was born in Elabun, Israel, Galilee, Palestine, whatever you want to call it. I never know what to call it. It's going to offend somebody no matter what. So I decided the best thing for me to be is a member of the Church Christ, the old time Church Christ. And I grew up at Harding University. That's where I grew up. I got there about to turn 16. I learned what we called New Testament Christianity back then. Are you listening to me? Take notes. Check this out later. Don't attack me now. Just check it out later. I was taught what we called New Testament Christianity. And one of my professors, Jimmy Allen, called me boy all the time. Boy, suede, that a boy, that a boy, that a boy, 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 boy. Well, let me tell you what I never did. I never called him boy. The reason I say that is because this past week, my wife called Jimmy Allen saying, Sway talks about you. He's been so hungry to have a conversation with you. 
He said, tell that boy I said hello. <laughs> Nothing has changed. He said, tell that boy, and I can see him saying, a boy, say, I said hello. But what I don't do is I don't call him boy. You wonder where I'm going with this? Let's get started. Now this is Psalm 110, which is often referred to. And uh, Robert spoke last week, and he talked about the Psalms. And some of the Psalms are referred to as polemic sci sci uh, Psalms. Some of them are known as messianic predictive signs or Psalms. And so just remember that the Psalms are different in nature. And this one I picked, and I want to make a few points about it. So let's read the Psalm. So you follow with me over here, right? And I'm going to read it to you over here, which some people wonder what that is, and it's backwards. So, everybody start reading the first line. Le David Mizmor, ni om Adonai, le Adoni shev le mini al eshet, oi vecha hadom le raglecha. Mataos ha ishlah Adonai mitsayon, rde bekerev oi vecha. Amcha, where's that little laser thing that we have bought here at Homewood? Is there a pointing laser? There's not a pointing laser? All right, my finger is going to be the pointing laser. This one. Amchan dubot biyom helecha bihadrei kodesh merechem meshhar lecha tal yaldotecha. Brett's got one? Thank you, Brett. Sir, thank you, sir. Brett, you're a good man uh, in many ways. Nishba Adonai, velo yinahem, ata kohen, laolam, al divrate malkei tzedek. Adonai, al yimin cha, mahatz biyom apo mlachim, yadin bagoyim, malay gvuyot, mahatz rosh, al eretz rabba, Menahal bederech yeshte al ken yarim rosh. The language you use to say something can make a big difference. What I can tell you is that translating into another language anything of great value does not always give you the real sense or meaning of what it really means. And some people, when reading a translation, think that they really know what it really means, and boy, they're willing to debate and argue about it. But let me tell you something. You get a New York guy up here. I'm already violated, and I said I'm going to have my head bowed in humble spirit today. And it is, but I, it's just my speaking style, so forgive me. You get a guy from New York down here, and you tell him that you just done it, done it and he's going to have no idea what you said. <laughs> and there is nothing I hate more than a guy from England or Australia trying to explain to me about the Auburn-Alabama rivalry and the reasons for it. <laughs> they don't know. You just can't feel it. I don't know why I'm an Alabama fan. I don't really know, and you don't really know. Every, but we sure know a lot more than some guys just going to show up who just read it in a newspaper in England. They just don't make sense. So translation is such a powerful force in putting in one's mind an idea or a thought. Now, having said that, I'm going to quickly talk to you about a couple of things. One is, look, is that in the original, we think this psalm was written by David. But the original language say, Le David Mizmor, to David, a psalm. Somebody else wrote the psalm about David. Of David, a psalm. The word of the Lord, Master, wait on my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for you. Now look, I'm going I'm to talk a certain way because that's how I am. 
And if you like it and agree with me, you ought to get pumped up like I am. But if you don't agree with me, pray for my salvation. <laughs> and if you think I'm way off here in the left field, well, just keep it to yourself for the next 30 minutes. And then get me later. Or get me when you get a chance to speak. Because I sit and listen to people say anything they want to say. And I love them, and I try to understand. So let me tell you a couple of things I feel strongly about. The staff of your might, the Lord will send from Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Am I grand staff? Am I making a point here with my? Yeah, I am. And you better listen to me. Your people will volunteer on the day of your host because of the beauty of holiness of your womb and the youth and all of it. The dew, you're like the dew. The Lord swore and will not repent. You are a priest forever because of the speech of Melchizedek. The Lord on your right hand has crushed kings of, on the day of his wrath. He will execute justice upon the nations. Sorry, that is mild. In Hebrew it says, Adonai al yamin kham ahatz bayom. But this one, Yadin bagoyim. Yadin bagoyim. He shall judge the goyim. You know who the goyim are? You. 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 Me. The goyim is anyone who is not Jewish. If you are not Jewish, you are a goy. And the Lord is going to judge you. He's coming after you. I'm not making this up. Yadin Bagoyim, Malek Vuyot, it's going to be full of corpses. Mahat Roch Al Eris Rabba, crush somebody's head in a big land. Menahal Baderech Yeshte Al Ken Yarom Rosh. And when he finished, he's going to be sweaty and tired, kicking your behinds. And he, on the way back, is going to stoop down, drink a little water from a spring, and then he's going to lift his head. He's going to be victorious. He's going to catch that pass, and he's going to go in the end zone, and he's going to do this. He's going to pose. Hang with me. Hang with me. Please. This is a song written by an oracle from God to the king, David or Solomon. We don't know which one. Praising them and reassuring them and trying to give legitimacy to their being king. Because if it's in the case of Solomon, Adonijah was fighting him for the throne. And they were competing as to who was going to get to be king. And there was a big battle between them. And David, as we said last week, was in all kinds of trouble. His own son Absalom was out to get him. And this oracle was trying to give David reassurance that he will be a king, not only a world king in the earthly sense, but also that he is going to be like the priest Melchizedek and be a spiritual leader for his people. He is trying to give him a sense of legitimacy. But in the process, he is telling him that you will be victorious and crush your enemies and pile up their corpses all over the place. Now, that's what the psalm says. Now, go to the next one, please, Christy. Thank you. Baby. I want to talk to you about two words that may cause confusion. And hey, those of you who are like the Pharisees that used to always trap Jesus, I know what you're going to say in a minute. I'm getting there, okay? So hang on. Turn to Luke chapter 20 and verse, verse 41. Jesus made this psalm famous because Jesus referred to this psalm. So turn to that, and who wants to read it? Leon, do you have a Bible? Will you stand up and read 41 to 44 very quickly? 
from Luke chapter 20, 41, 44. If you found Luke, do you know where that is? In the New Testament, right, right. Go ahead. 44, it's not long. See, in the psalm, if you look, there is this word, Lord, in the English translation, and then there is this word, Lord. So the Lord said to my Lord, and so a confusion arises. But in the Hebrew, there is no confusion, because this word, Lord, is spelled like this. And this one is spelled like this. I was almost tempted to write from left to right. But I had to write from right to left. See, these two words in Hebrew are not the same. This is Y-H-V-H, and this is A-D-N-O. They're not the same word. So the confusion is less. This word is Yahweh in English. But the Jews are not allowed to pronounce the word and utter it. So instead they say, Adonai. Adonai. Well, that's what Christy went to all this work for. See, this one, Adonai with a little sh uh, this thing above the A. Versus the other one is Adoni. Adonai is the big guy. He's God. Adoni is the little guy, my master, my lord, as in English movies when they call their king lord. Right? So in the original, there is no confusion about lord said to my lord, because God is speaking to God. Well, that's a little difficult to understand. So now you don't have to be confused. It's not God speaking to God. Because there are some people who make fun of us for saying that. It's Yahweh speaking to Adoni, King David, telling him that he is going to conquer all of his enemies and destroy them. Now, why am I so worked up about this? Now listen to me carefully. Take notes. Don't shout at me. Go home, check it out later. There are those who say that this psalm is a prophecy about the Mashiach, the Messiah to come, who will do all of these things. That it's a messianic prophet, prophecy. Little language now, take notes. I don't get this chance and I may never have another one. Messiah. Messiah. You hear this word a lot. Messiah, messianic. Messiah, messianic, messiah. The word messiah as such occurs one time in the Old Testament. Once. In Daniel. And do you know who it refers to? Cyrus the king of the Persians. He was a Messiah. The word Messiah in Hebrew is the word Mashiach, which means anointed. Anointed. That's all the word Messiah means. Someone who is anointed with oil. There were a lot of Messiahs in the Old Testament. Every king of Israel was anointed with oil to become a legitimate king. Now, when you take this word, that's all it means, anointed. When you take this word and say it's Messiah, that's the Aramaic and Arabic version of the word. You know what that word means? It means 
wiper, cleanser of sin. Al Masih is the one who goes after you eat a meal at a table and takes a rag and wipes it off. So depending on the language you use to describe this person, there are different meanings to it. Then there's the word Jesus. There is less confusion about who that is. We don't have to argue the meaning of Jesus. We know who that is. On the way to Damascus, the apostle Paul was walking along and something miraculous happened to him and he stopped in his tracks. And he said, who is this? Now I'm changing my tone. He said, this is Jesus whom you persecute. This is who? Jesus. He could have said, this is the man who's going to stomp all over you, Paul. He said, this is Jesus whom you persecute. Well, Jesus wasn't even on earth. How was Paul persecuting him? He was persecuting the Christians, the followers of Jesus. And to Jesus, the two are one and the same. You persecute the Christians, and I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Israeli. I don't care if you're Jewish. I don't care if you're Al-Qaeda. I don't care who you are. If you persecute Christians, you are persecuting the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I think. And that's what I read in the Bible. That's what Jesus says. So, Having said that, Jesus, when given the chance to say nothing but one word to describe himself, what did he say? This is Jesus. I don't hear this word much anymore in our culture and society. I don't. I hear Messiah, prophecy, the end of the world, fighting, wars. I don't hear Jesus much. Look, you may hate me right now. I know you say, this guy is nuts. I do not care. I have confidence that Jesus is who he is, and he is my Savior. Now, so the argument goes on, and you hear it. Some of you go to churches that talk more about this than even this one. The argument goes on. Is that psalm prophesying the Messiah, or is it not? Well, the rabbis say it's not. We say it is. Yes, it is. This guy says, no, it's not. This guy says, yes, it is. It's a prophecy. Jesus talked about this in Luke to say one thing, and if you read the whole thing in context, what is Jesus saying? Jesus saying that Christ cannot be the son of David. All of you are taught Jesus, the son of David. Christ is saying clearly he cannot be the son of David because of the language used, the ambiguity of it. But no matter what, he's saying, I'm Jesus. It says that. I know you're looking at me. What? It just says that. How can he be the son of Jesus, of David? It says it right here. Do you know people who say Jesus is the son of David and he's from the tribe of Judah? Do you know what they're saying? They are showing their heart. Their heart is that they do not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus does not have a, an earthly father. He doesn't. His father is the Holy Spirit. 
And there is no self-respecting Jewish rabbi that would ever tell you that Jesus is, in a sense, the son of David. And that he has an earthly father. It does not exist. Get over it. He is not from any tribe. He is Jesus, standalone, unique. Every one of you have got 46 chromosomes in your blood. If you checked here, he'd have half. Only from his mother. Well, isn't that enough to make him a Jew? No, it's not. And I hear people at the Lord's Supper emphasizing the Jewishness of Jesus. Yo, that's pigeonholing him too much. He's for all the world and all eternity. You're taking Jesus and cramming him into a box. Thank you. A couple of heads nodding and a couple saying, I'm going to get you. <laughs> if you get me with scripture, I will lie down. But if you don't, then you better think about it. He was born of the Virgin Mary. What about the genealogy? What about it? It's a polite, quiet way to tell the people of the day that he has got some relationship to you all, and he's got some prophecies that speak about him being the one you should be looking for. And it still didn't make a difference. Go to the next one, Christy, please, ma'am. Now, this is the translation in the English of that psalm. See here it says, the Lord says to my Lord, Oh, here we go now. Here we go, the messianic people. The Lord, God, like, like we need help. Like I need your help to tell me who the, who the psalm is talking about. Says to my Lord, the Messiah. Where did you get that commentator? You make that stuff up. And God will judge you for it. So you could read the, the rest of it. Next one. Hang on. So now, people say, well, this is a prophecy about the Messiah. OK? Plays, plays this clip right here. This is with all due love and respect. Just play it if it will play. I just want you to know that there are two sides to every coin. Man, I've lost track of time. There's a lot I want to say. Why don't you click right here, it says play, whatever that is, Christy. It doesn't matter. It's OK, honey, it doesn't matter. Point is, let me, let me just tell you what these gentlemen are discussing. They're very studied rabbis who are talking to each other. And basically, they're saying, look, the Christians say prophecies about Jesus, prophecies, prophecies, prophecies. We don't care. Jesus is not the Messiah that we expect. He's just not the one. That's what they're saying. All right? So it becomes an argument back and forth. And guess what? What happens when we're arguing about that? Christy, forget about it, please, and just go to the next slide because it's really what I'm trying to say. Don't worry. It's all good. I, I never need visual aids. You people lost my notes. What do I do now? You know I pumped up with my head about these notes? <laughs> this guy is funny. This guy over here is a little sarcastic, but it doesn't matter. Go next one. So we got people arguing on whether these things are prophesying about Jesus or not. And, and they say this doesn't make sense to us, but we say, oh, it's got to make sense to you. So we're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Why should we try? Why should we waste the energy of arguing about who is who and what's going to happen when? Why should we? Because let me tell you what we should do. I will tell you what we should do. Here it is. You read the psalm and the spirit of that psalm, a spirit of conquest, 
a spirit of destruction, a spirit of winning. I wanted to put this side by side with it, and as I read my Bible, let me tell you what I find. I find that Jesus said in John 18, 36, Mike, listen carefully, please, I beg you, this may be the last time that you will hear someone this frankly and honestly tell you what the New Testament says. Because my eight-year-old boy came out now and now of class last time and said, Dad, we started about some guy gouging his eyes out in the old... I'm scared. Old Testament is full of stories like that. Jesus said, and keep in mind what the, what the psalmist was bragging about. Now for you who want comfort, just listen carefully. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not an earthly kingdom. He said, for I am gentle, meek, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. People say, well, I can't like David. He messed around, he did all this stuff, and God in his goodness and grace forgave him. That's why I like David. You should love Jesus more. 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 Not less, more. I will give you rest for your soul. Matthew 5, 44. Jesus speaking. This is tough. It says, hard. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Jesus said, blessed in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, the gentle, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, Dr. Sway, don't you know the Bible says there will be no peace and people are going to fight with each other? And there are all these wars and rumors of wars. We ought to just give in to that. It's all bad. The end of the world is coming. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall call be sons of God. The peacemakers. Don't let things get you cynical. I am moved by my, an article written about my brother in Israel, in the Times of Israel. He's the only Christian in the Israeli parliament. And he preaches a message consistent with Jesus. That we need to get along and try to show the love of Jesus, which is the only, that w the only thing that will, will result in any good for all people. Father, forgive them, Jesus said, for they know not what they do. And then the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Man, somebody bucks up against me, and they want to fight, and guess what I want to do? Let me tell you, I could shoot a Glock 9 as good as anybody sitting here, except maybe Leon. <laughs> maybe Steve. But I could put six right here so quick, you won't know what hit you. Don't misunderstand. <laughs> but listen. The strength of Christ is made perfect in weakness. If I try to come at somebody and they're, I'm so sorry, I, I put that Glock back down. They're not worth fighting for or with. 
It's more powerful sometimes to be humble and meek and loving and kind than it is to be a kicker. I wanted to contrast the Jesus I know with the psalm that we read. I wanted to contrast. Jesus washed people's feet. He did not use his foot to step on anybody's head. Do you ever think about that? That psalm is saying, I'm going to make all your enemies your footstool. This guy says, I wash people's feet. I don't use my feet to step on anybody. Do you see why I'm not bothered by what people want to say about what's going to happen and what things mean? It's the gentility and the love of Christ that guides me through my days. This week, I've had two people make an impact on my life. A 50-year-old, very successful banker, probably right next to the top guy in a bank you probably, 70% of you go to. Man walks in, fine, until a week ago. Has a little spell which he calls out of body experience. His wife is with him, sweet lady. He's sitting there. The end of the story is that it's bad, it's very bad. It's not going to be good. And let me tell you, they're praying people. Some prayers are answered just like you want them to. Some, for God's purposes, may not be. That man has a staff of 50. They all noticed something was wrong. He now sits there. And I know what's coming. I could say, don't worry, David conquered his enemies and stepped all over him. But David himself said in Psalm 6, what does it profit a man when he's in the grave? He can't do any good. It's over with. Read Psalm 6, chapter, uh, verse 5. Because David didn't believe in the afterlife and the resurrection and being alive forever with Jesus. He wants to it if he did. But guess what the assurance I can give that man? is that you have a savior who will take care of you. The spirit of humility enters us when we are weak. We begin to see clearly who our savior is. Another man of an equally bad story. But if you see these people at that moment, the last thing they want to hear about is John Hagee talking about all the wars and all the things that are going to happen for the Messiah to come and sit on his kingdom on Mount Zion. That's not going to do a whole lot of good. In my line of work, it doesn't get me or them very far. But I do see that when they bow their head and bow to Jesus, who is the Savior forever, I see that that, that gives the heart the comfort and the reassurance it needs. I ask you today without getting too specific to please know that the Bible teaches us that Jesus is never, write this down, oh boy, it's going to shake you up. You're going to be running out of here calling Brother Hagee. I do not care. Record this and send it to him. The Bible does not teach us that Jesus will ever set foot on this earth again. Does not. All this millennial stuff you hear about, oh, this kingdom that's coming. He will not set foot on earth. Thessalonians, when the end comes, we shall meet him up in the clouds so that we forever may be with the Lord. And this kingdom they talk about, it's already come. 
It came 2,000 years ago. You're living in it the, for the first and last time. What do you think two years, 2,000 years ago? Jesus came to do a dry run? <laughs> Check things out. All right, but I'm coming back to establish one, and I'm going to want you to be one of the 12 people leading things. Oh, yeah, right. He was, he was, he was, what's the FBI term for somebody who's snooping around on a house to know when to attack? What is that? Casing the place? Or? What do you all think? Jesus came the first time to case this place? No, 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 no. He came to establish his kingdom, which was at hand. You're living in it. So what do we busy ourselves with? We busy ourselves with finding out what he tells us to do. How to love each other. How to care about those who are downtrodden and needy and weak. How we should reach into whatever resource we have to help each other. And to accomplish his goal, which is... Which is Love each other as I have loved you. The focus of my faith is Jesus Christ. And in him only, you will attain victory. You can line up all the F-16s and all the marine divisions you want. And I love them when they are defending us in the right way. But your victory will come in one name. Jesus now, will you stand and sing that for me? I don't know. We're running over time. Brett, I love you. You have done a great job, and you have been preaching this message from the pulpit. And I love you, and I thank you. That we need to read the New Testament and find out more about Jesus. Because our victory is in him. And so this morning, I heard Alan Jackson about the gentle, sweet, kind ways of a southern small-town man. And how he bowed his head to Jesus. And how when he died, he said to his family, don't cry, don't worry, because the angels are holding my hand. And because God has a place in heaven for the gentle, kind, small town southern man. But I'll add to that, Yankees too. <laughs> the mark is Jesus. Will you sing it with me? Everybody, please, who knows how to sing this time, one or two verses. I think Brett will give us one or two minutes and we'll be done. Who is the rest of the Church of Christ choir that I see up here? <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I stole your time to begin with because I was saving it for you to the end. Come up here. Anybody else wants to help? Come on, Ron. You can't let this man do this by himself. Everybody stand. Let's send there is victory. There you are. I know you're one of them. No, there is victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from, from glory How he gave my life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious love's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory.